Welcome back, everyone. Take your seats if you don't mind. We're going to keep rolling. One good session after the other. That was a fascinating conversation uh, with Neil Vogel, the CEO of Dot Dash Meredith, talking about growing and profitability of publishers. And now we're going to have a fascinating conversation about removing profit from newsrooms, panacea or peril. The moderator is Liza Gross. We have Mazin Sidamed, Stephen Engelberg, Julia Angwin, and Annie Madonia here to speak with us. Liza, I'm going to let you take it away. And I look forward to this. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I heard, or we heard, that there are students and fellows here, so we want to give a shout out to you guys, the future of the profession. Yeah. So, I am Lisa Gross. Uh, I am Vice President for Practice Change at Solutions uh, Journalism Network, and I'll be copsing this squad for the next uh, hour or so on the topic of nonprofit uh, newsrooms or the nonprofit model, business model for news organizations. Um, we have assembled a stellar panel, a more than a stellar <laughs> panel, thank you, Sabu, uh, to dig deep into the um, implications of this business model that has kind of become the sweetheart, uh, the soup du jour in terms of uh, our uh, focus of attention uh, for uh, sustainability, long-term sustainability of our industry and our, and our profession. Uh, before we move um, on, can I have a show of hands how many of you have direct experience working for a nonprofit model or having done? Okay, all right, that will help us uh, kind, of, kind of frame the discussion. So um, I did what everybody does uh, these days, and I went to the Google machine and asked for a definition <laughs> of what is a nonprofit organization, just so that oh, we are all man. singing from the same sheet music. And so it's a legal entity organized and operated for a collective public or social benefit, in contrast with an entity that operates as a business aiming to generate profits. So with this definition, we're going to be moving forward. I will ask all of our panelists to give us a brief overview on why they have chosen a nonprofit model for their own news organizations, what has their experience been, but also the broader picture of um, a nonprofit model for um, journalism and journalists. So Steve, can we start with you? Sure. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Engelberg. I'm editor-in-chief of ProPublica. Uh, ProPublica is now in its 14th year, uh, and the notion behind it back in 2007, 2008, was founded by uh, a couple of uh, quite uh, wealthy people who had uh, started a small bank, which became a very large bank, which they then sold and decided to devote uh, the remaining profits that they uh, take, took out of that to uh, improving various philanthropic things, uh, one of which was investigative journalism. Um, the notion that they began with was that there was a coming storm in the for-profit journalism sector and that um, the single most expensive, easy to cut sort of line of uh, investment or uh, cost in any newsroom would be investigative reporting since um, there, there are a number of good reasons why you'd get rid of investigative reporters. Uh, number one, they, they do take forever times two um, to get anything done. So you don't get a lot of what we, what they, what we still call, I guess, content out of them. Um, second of all, um, in the for-profit space, um, they have an annoying habit of, uh, you know, irritating the, the advertisers. Um, they, they write stories that, that people who are supposedly going to buy your ads absolutely hate. Um, so, you know, as times got tough, and this was, uh, you know, at this point when they started, times were not as tough as they got. Uh, the anticipation, correct as it turned out, was that a lot of organizations uh, would be forced to cut back. And so we went out and uh, made an argument in creating ProPublica that investigative reporting um, is a lot like uh, a lot of other public goods um, that the market doesn't provide uh, an adequate supply of. Um, you know, and we can think about that in a lot of regards. You can look at you know, your museums, your, your symphony orchestra, the ballet. Um, all of those things are hybrids. I mean, they, they do try to raise some, uh, you know, what we call in the nonprofit space, earned revenue. Um, but they, they don't pay for themselves, and so they depend on philanthropy uh, to make the rest of it happen. Um, this is a, a, a fairly radical argument um, in what we're used to in America. Um, I was just uh, talking to my former panelists here. I was on the phone this morning 
Uh, I'm on the board of uh, something called the Montclair Local. I live in Montclair, New Jersey, and we have a weekly newspaper that is a nonprofit. And the town, if you don't know it, is a, is a place with a lot of, you know, very well-educated, smart people in different walks of life, including journalism, but a bunch of other ones. And I have been involved in, uh, you know, probably now 50 one-on-one -on -one meetings with potential funders. And it is interesting to me that as you explain the problem, it is clear that outside our realm, very few people appreciate and understand how broken our business models have become. And it's quite a shock to them to hear that um, the news business is by and large um, not very profitable. Um, we publish a weekly uh, print newspaper that goes to many people in Montclair and people say to me, I don't know, I see the paper, it's, it's got ads in it, what's the problem? <laughs> um, you have a website that's got, that's got ads. What's the problem? And so it takes about 45 minutes to walk people through, you know, Craig Newmark classified ads and the rest of it. And by the end, everybody says, wow, I should be supporting this. Um, but I think very, very few people to this day fully understand and appreciate um, how much, A, the democracy hangs on getting people information that is actionable, that if you're going to cast a vote or have an opinion, you should actually potentially want to know what it's about. Um, and that jur journalism is, is sort of that lifeblood of our democracy, and that be uh, the, the business model for paying for it is uh, significantly hampered. And yes, um, there are some big winners out there. I left the New York Times in 2003. We had 1,100 newsroom employees. Today they have 1,700, so that's a great success story. Who said the internet was all bad uh, for the news business? But I see that as a great exception. Um, so I'll turn it over to Julia, who uh, she and I first met when I enticed her to leave the Wall Street Journal for a nonprofit. I think people thought you were crazy, but you stayed in it. Yeah. Um, well, I worked um, across the street at the Wall Street Journal here um, in the World Financial Center for 14 years, and then joined Steve at ProPublica, and, um, and then eventually left to start my own nonprofit newsroom, The Markup, that launched, we started publishing uh, two years ago. Um, right, two weeks before the pandemic hit, so that was awesome. <laughs> so our entire life has been in crisis. Um, and, um, you know, honestly, I, um, I'm so, so grateful to ProPublica for paving the way because they proved that there was a nonprofit model for journalism. I grew up in Silicon Valley and I cover tech and Markup is, uh, covers tech. And so I actually knew that the profit model for journalism was screwed because I could see the tech companies eating all of the ad revenue. Um, but it wasn't, you know, until ProPublica approved an alternate model, it wasn't actually clear what that other model would be. And so it is really wonderful that ProPublica built and paved the way, but it is also worth noting that like donors don't still really totally understand um, that journalism needs to be funded. A lot of um, the donors that we talk to think you can buy coverage, like, oh, I want this story <laughs> written, um, and we do a lot of education. And, you know, honestly, I sometimes think back nostalgically to the advertisers. They actually knew they couldn't ask for a story, right? And so they might pull their ads after they didn't like a story, but they didn't usually ask for something proactively. And so it is a different um, dance that you have to do in nonprofit journalism. But I do think it's a great model if more donors could show up because so much journalism needs to be getting done in this country and around the world that is um, really withering right now uh, with the collapse of the for-profit model. Which I think that Jim van der Heijer of Axios would disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, to my left, uh, ProPublica pioneer and uh, Julia, a very high-profile journalist with uh, a national new publication on the right, though, we have other um, perspectives that will help us round off the, uh, this concept of nonprofit. Annie Madonia from the Lenfest Institute did not begin in journalism, right. so her perspective is particularly valuable. Now you are in this space, and what are uh, your thoughts regarding sustainability, nonprofits, journalism versus others? Well, the Lenfest Institute, we're fairly agnostic as to nonprofit versus for profit news. We believe that media ecosystems really can benefit from both if they're properly managed and properly funded, collaborative, and coordinate um, together. And ProPublica certainly did prove the model that nonprofit news can be sustainable and grow and thrive. We were established in about 2017 when 
Our founder, Jerry Lenfest, a cable mogul turned billionaire philanthropist, bought the Philadelphia Inquirer and donated it to what is now called the Lenfest Institute for Journalism. We are a nonprofit. The Philadelphia Inquirer is not. We are the non-controlling owner of the Philadelphia Inquirer. They have their own board and their own objectives. Our mission is to develop and sustain and support sustainable business models for public service journalism. And the Inquirer is now the largest, public, largest American newspaper operated as a public benefit corporation in the country. And what that means is they are not beholden to shareholders, they are beholden to the community. And any profit that they make either goes right into the journalism and the business or gets profit shared among the employees of the organization. Our, the way we approach our mission is we raise money, we run programs, and we make grants to support innovative approaches to the business model, both at the Inquirer, across the Philadelphia ecosystem, throughout Pennsylvania, and actually now across the country. Um, and it's been very interesting to watch. I come from to fundraising and communications and so forth from a nonprofit background, always in the performing arts. And the similarities between orchestras, as an example, uh, and news and local news are quite remarkable, and I can talk about that a little bit um, later on. But our, our benefactor, Jerry, believed that local news organizations are absolute civic treasures yeah. and essential to democracy and to your local communities and deserve philanthropic support from the community just like your local hospital, museum, orchestra, ballet, social service agencies. And so that's the message that we try to take out and deliver on behalf of the Inquirer, but then for news organizations across the country as well. Well, thank you. Masin, uh, your organization may be, uh, folks here may be the least familiar with uh, your organization, um, Document in New York. So can you frame that for us first? Um, sure. And if you are not familiar with it, after the session, run and check it out because <laughs> he is doing fantastic, inno fantastically innovative things in Planet Queens, yeah. two million <laughs> strong community, right? Yeah, yeah, totally, yes. Thank you so much for having me and I appreciate that introduction. So yeah, four years ago, me and a friend of mine started a publication called Documented. It is a nonprofit news outlet focused on covering New York City's immigrants and the policies that affect their lives. And we do that in a number of ways. We um, really try and create news that's actually for an immigrant audience. So we use different distribution channels such as WhatsApp to really engage with and ask undocumented immigrants in New York City, what do you want from a news product? How can we actually create news that's of service to you and is useful to you in your day-to-day -day lives? So when we were starting out, we were actually also agnostic about should we do nonprofit or should we do for-profit? And when we looked at, first of all, from the for-profit perspective, the scale that we would need to actually run a newsroom and do high-quality journalism with advertising revenue, it was just uh, unrealistic. You know, it didn't really make sense. Um, and I think a lot of the kind of BuzzFeed and HuffPost are also kind of seeing that that model is not really uh, sustainable to create high-quality news. So we felt like that was unrealistic to begin with. And the other portion of the for-profit model that we really struggled with was if we wanted to do a membership plan or you know, earn revenue through getting our readers to pay a monthly subscription or monthly donations, doing that for a low wage audience would have been incredibly difficult. It would have really changed our editorial coverage and forced us to create news that was of value to people who were um, making more money in their, in their jobs or had a specific expertise or creating new niche information like Politico that was of incredibly high value. And we really wanted to have a broad audience um, of people who were you know, most affected by immigration policies and make sure that our journalism wasn't just about low-wage immigrants, but it was actually for low-wage immigrants and they were using it in their day-to-day -day lives. And to do that, the philanthropic model and non-profit model just made the most sense. Um, you know, it's not to say that we're completely opposed to any earned revenue, but subsidizing that work with philanthropic support, it really aligned with the way that we were approaching the work anyway. You know, we're a mission-driven organization. Um, I think a lot of journalists approach their work from a mission-driven perspective. It was really a no-brainer when we just sat down and did the math. So to kick off the discussion, and when, when you are talking about the nonprofit model being the best choice for you, and um, what is the mix of funders you look at? Because your, the nature of your organization, of your news organization, is very and the mission of it is very different from Julia's or from Steve's. Totally. I can really empathize with what Julia said, though, about 
being concerned around funders driving the coverage because you know there's a, a small but growing uh, news philanthropy community but they're still like a limited portion of the pie so if you want to really grow and build like a, a long-term sustainable model you have to look at kind of the broader picture of um, foundations and philanthropists in the US so then you kind of get into this issue of people who are less familiar with news and maybe more familiar with doing philanthropy around immigrant rights issues or you know New York City you know people who want to make New York City into a healthy and thriving place and I think when you get into those conversations it does get a little bit more complicated and you do really have to um, rely on you know what your mission is and what you're looking to do I think the way that one of the biggest fears that we have is mission creep so there's a lot of funding around a particular issue every two or three years there's something that's kind of in vogue in philanthropy mm -hmm. and it's really easy for you as a nonprofit to just kind of like pursue the most popular thing in philanthropy in that moment and what happens to a lot of nonprofits is five or six years down the line they just have no identity whatsoever they're just a hodgepodge of things that were kind of popular in the philanthropic space each and every every couple of years so what we try and do is create a strategic plan where we know what we want to do we have you know real strong goals around labor coverage that's something that was important to us around when we first started you know um, climate change something that's really important to us now and finding funders and philanthropists who understand that and want to support that work as opposed to um, kind of chasing the money in another way I think that that's so important it's so, when we started the Lenfest Institute we put up a giant poster of a tail and a, a dog and a wagging tail you don't want the tail to wag the dog it's like any other nonprofit you have to be true to your mission and you have to really believe in what you're doing and find funders that align with that as opposed to vice vice versa and it can be challenging but it's so 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 important Julia, does this resonate with you? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, and it's particularly true in the field um, of tech. So we cover tech, and we're investigative journalists investigating tech, but also a lot of our readers are in tech, and their whole model is venture capital, right? And it's very directive, right? The idea is you want somebody to build an app, you pay them to build that app. And so they sort of see, you know, coverage and stories as like, why can't I just have that? I'm master of the universe, I have all the money and I want the things. We're really lucky that our core funder, Craig Newmar, is not like that. He yeah. um, early on was like, look, um, he gave us a big grant that sort of like set us on our feet and that he, he's like, I'm not gonna be involved, I have no interest in being involved and that, that's a real gift and that's really rare, you know. Um, um, a lot of people in Silicon Valley just have a very different experience within, with funding and honestly, most of them are still pretty early in their philanthropy. Mm -hmm. They're mostly still kind of in their business and so they think of the business as, you know, what can I get for it? What's my return on investment? And like, as Steve said, like we're a public good, right? The return on the investment is that the world doesn't collapse as quickly as it might have otherwise. <laughs> that's that's inspiring. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I want to get my checkbook right out. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I I think this is something that we have um, sort of faced from the very early days of ProPublica. We were also um, extremely fortunate. I should have mentioned their names, Herb. The late Herb and Marion Sandler were the people who started ProPublica, and like Craig, were willing to put money on the table for multiple years um, to let us build something. Because it's very, very hard to go to a funder and say, I've got an idea. Um, would you give me a large sum of money? Um, I'll make it real. Um, they generally will sort of you know, squint their eyes and say, come back when you have something. So there's this chicken and egg problem of how do you get started. And a number of these organizations have had these kind of angel investors. Herb was so strict about this sort of thing. The first resolution of the ProPublica board was that no board member would ever be told in advance what stories were being done or what stories were about to appear. Um, we would have uh, occasionally uh, events where the reporters would be mingling with the, the founding donor and they would start to say, I'm on an amazing story. And Herb would literally begin running across the room saying, you can't tell me that. <laughs> um, this is not always the way it works with your average program officer at a foundation. <laughs> And so that conversation is a sort of daily and ongoing uh, uh, dance where, you know, people are sort of saying, okay, and we know we can't order up a story, but, but can you make it in this area? And depending on the size and shape of the area, that might either be a very good idea or a very bad idea because some ways of defining the areas 
um, sort of imply an answer. And so, you know, we will turn down money that people want to give us um, if the answer is implied in the question. Uh, my colleague Dick Tofel, uh, our founding uh, sort of first uh, business development person, president, um, used to say, and I think this was very wise, uh, investigative reporting is where you start with a question and get to an answer. And if a grant implies we start with an answer and get to the evidence, then we're not taking it. And, and that, that turns out to be a pretty good sort of Occam's razor between what you want to do and what um, you don't want to do. Uh, but those pressures are there literally every day, and I understand it. I mean, if you're running a personal foundation, you're Herbert Marion Sandler, you have lots of money, you decide what you want to do with it. But a lot of these foundations, you know, have uh, phalanxes of people who oversee the programs and officers and so on, and some of those people over the years have suggested specific story ideas, um, and we have told them that we're not going to be doing it that way. Um, and sometimes those grants are renewed, and sometimes they're not. <laughs> Well, I was in a breakfast once with Dick Tofel when he said his um, way of raising funds was going to the funder and saying, this is what I need. Mm -hmm. And I thought he was half joking, but it spoke to the fact that he knew exactly what he wanted. He was focused, laser focused. Well, I will say, if you're in this line of work, one thing that has been successful for us, should you ever find yourself um, either working at or running a nonprofit, I, I think what Muzin said is very right. You have to have a strategic vision. Mm -hmm. And so we write down from time to time dreams. If somebody would drop X number of dollars out of the sky and us, what would we do with it? Um, and every now and again, somebody comes along and says, I want to fund X. And we say, well, actually, we have a little proposal right here. It's X sort of, X adjacent, or X sort of, but more. Um, and this occasionally does work out organically, where you find people funding uh, things that you've dreamed of doing. Um, we have now opened a, a, a unit that's doing sort of global pandemic coverage into the future. A lot of people are sort of saying, and I understand this, I'm really tired of COVID, let's not do so much of that anymore, but our, my argument would be now, maybe we can learn some lessons and double down. We happen to have a funder who came in and said, I'm really interested in global public health. We were able to present a pretty polished proposal that we had been working on for just such a moment. And I think that's, that's the beautiful sort of connection that right. you can get it certainly doesn't happen every day, and, and it's equally plausible that somebody comes in and says, yeah, I like your ideas, but let me tell you what I think. And of course, here we're talking to a group that um, has been quite successful at articulating a vision, or articulating a strategy, and executing on that strategy. But my question is, and we discussed this during our prep meeting, are we placing unrealistic expectations around the nonprofit model as the savior for the journalism industry. I mean, it's no secret we are facing a tremendous challenge with the erosion of our traditional business models and an urgent search for finding a long-term uh, response to that um, that will keep journalism thriving and um, being making a contribution it should make to society at large. That are we in danger of, because besides having a clear mission, you need to be fiduciary responsible and you need to have your strategy. Can we speak a little bit to that? Steve, can we oh, start uh, with you? Uh, just very quickly, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues, but sure, I mean, I, I think it can't be the only answer. Um, it's an answer. Um, and, you know, as more Americans, I think, understand the true threat that we face in our democracy and the role journalism plays, it is plausible that more people will give. We are actually a very generous country, and a tiny amount of that is going to journalism today. So I think there's room. Um, but I absolutely would agree if we can get closer to a hybrid in which there is some earned revenue and there are some streams. You know, I'm happy to sell anything. You, you know, we've sold T-shirts, coffee mugs, whatever. I mean, we'd be, if we could find something that would really float the boat, we would sell that too. Um, but we have not yet. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear what, what others think about that. Nasi, let's go to you. Yeah, I um, I think that the emphasis on the savior in journalism has been really problematic. You know, I think that we had this one model. You know, you, you sell ads. Uh, in your newspaper, you sell ads on your TV station, your radio station for so long that we just thought with the rise of the internet, we would just find the one thing that would replace that or we would figure out a new way of doing it and then everything would be okay and we'd go back to you know, the glory days, whenever they were. And um, I just think the reality is a lot more complicated than that. Different models are going to work in different markets for different types of organizations. You know. Nonprofit really works for us. We do have some earned revenue. We do sell some ads, 
But I think forever we're going to be somewhat reliant on um, philanthropic support like any other public institutions in New York City. There are some markets where the for-profit model still works. You know, yeah. they have a very, you know, university towns where they're like people who are still really passionate about local news and really understand the value in it and they're willing to pay for it. Um, so there are different places. You know, I've seen cooperative models where the journalists own own the organization and everyone in the, in the community owns a piece of it. So we just have to get comfortable with the uncertainty that different things are going to work for different organizations and that it allows us to innovate and create new relationships with the people who consume news. And the uncertainty was uh, another word of saying, another way of saying what you and I were discussing before the meeting, adapt adaptive capabilities, and uh, uh, that is a key to whatever success you're looking for, whether it's in a non-profit or in a for-profit or in a hybrid model. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely right, adaptive capabilities. I mean, as I said, we're agnostic as to non-profit or for-profit. I think, we think that the answer lies in an ecosystem or ecosystems that have both, if possible, and that collaborate and coordinate together and stop this idea of sharp elbows, and that's my buyer and my subscriber, recognizing that a rising tide lifts all boats and our purpose is to inform and engage our communities in democracy, not necessarily to focus only on the North Star of a, of a subscriber or a, or, or a buyer. But I also think, as opposed to nonprofit and for-profit, the answer lies in philanthropy itself because for-profit news organizations can raise money if they can figure out unique structures with community organizations that can help them do that and help manage, you know, fiscally sponsor those, those resources. The biggest question is, as an industry, are we willing to think differently and behave differently and find a way to take advantage of what I think is one of the greatest untapped potentials for growing resource in this country. Americans contributed $500 billion in philanthropy last year. $500 billion. And 70% of that came from individuals. And of course, religion and healthcare, I mean, those are all very important causes. But there was something like 80 or 50 or 80, somewhere in there, billion dollars that went to public benefit nonprofits. So how do we structure ourselves and work together in a way that takes advantage of this revenue source so that all of us, nonprofit or unforeprofit, have diversified, multiple diversified revenue streams that, that can grow. Julia, are you thinking of that? <laughs> I mean, I think it's worth um, talking about other models as well, right? I mean, there we had a real moment in time where advertising was able to support journalism, but in retrospect, that appears to have been largely an aberration. Yeah. <laughs> and um, in reality, journalism has been funded by, you know, the local, you know, billionaire, millionaire, Money. whatever, right? Mm -hmm. a, a patron, right? It's been a patron business. And also, around the world, it has been supported by government funding. Mm -hmm. And I think we... Um, we, we've seen the rise of the patron, right? Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post, um, Elon Musk maybe buying Twitter, not deciding not to, whatever. But um, you know, but the government piece is something that you know we in the U.S. are really resistant to, and there's lots of very good reasons for that. But it's also worth noting that it does support like a really robust and thriving media ecosystem in Europe, for instance, and they do have some ways of putting the government funding into sort of a trust that then is distributed in a way that tries to like make it so the government is not influencing the coverage. And um, people are starting to talk about this as an additional model, right? So Maria Ressa, who won the Nobel Prize this year, um, is a journalist in the Philippines and she is working with, I think Mark Thompson, the former New York Times um, CEO to build this fund, a public interest media fund internationally that will fund um, journalism and is meant to have governments contribute money into it. And I think that's a really interesting model because I do, I think it's wonderful that Americans are willing to give, um, whether we can switch all of their dollars or any a significant enough portion to journalism remains to be seen, so why not add another piece mm -hmm. into this puzzle? Right. And I, I think we're seeing some of that starting to emerge in the United States. And my own state of New Jersey has a fund to support journalism. It started fairly recently. 
Um, but um, and the outcomes are still to be seen. But it is it is a uh, something in that direction. Of course, Steve Waldman has been agitated from report for America has been agitating for um, some uh, exploration of government participation in sustaining journalism as a public good. Now, I want to be if, my I, if I could just jump in there though, because I would like to offer. I saw some nods. I'm going to offer a head shake here. Uh, I am anti-government funding uh, into in, in the core of my uh, feet. Um, I, I am I, I, investigative reporters, surprisingly, everybody. I've spent most of my life as an investigative reporter. We're really optimists. We believe if people knew the truth, things would be better. So we are profoundly optimists. I'm not a cynic. Um, but I will say on this issue, I am a cynic. I do not trust anyone in government to leave uh, things in a lockbox in a lockbox. Having worked with Julia, I know she's reasonably cynical too. So I'm fascinated. <laughs> I'm fascinated. He's that you counting over, on you. <laughs> you. I'm fascinated that you've overcome your, your skepticism about big institutions and government to this extent. Because I feel like when you look at NPR, which has had, you know, frankly, you'd be surprised, a minimal amount of government funding. It's a small part of their budget. The threat that it would be taken away uh, in the early Trump years, I would argue. Um, had a kind of gravitational effect on their coverage, even though there was no serious move to do it. I think when you know 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 percent comes from something that's theoretically protected, but the government's giving it, it changes the way you think. So I, I remain pretty skeptical of it. How do I mean, you overcome I'm not, it? I'm not sure that I have overcome it. I'm saying... <laughs> oh, that's, that's the Julia I know. <laughs> I am saying that it is worth thinking about. And it's worth noting, the way Maria and Mark are structuring this is really about taking money that is being spent on overseas development, which is mm -hmm. basically in um, emerging economies, and saying, you know, what is also important is not just agriculture, but a thriving press to hold the government accountable. And so that's the, they're talking about it in a particular way. But I think the counter argument I would make to you, Steve, is like, who is more powerful right now in the world, the government or Google and Facebook who are mm. pouring money into right. all these newsrooms totally directly, yep. right? With no intermediary, no fund that tries to pretend that it's in independent. And they are unregulated companies that are bigger than any government. And it is not clear if they are governable, right? Like we are currently in a moment mm -hmm. in our society where it is not clear if they are the world government, right? Because they control speech around the country, <laughs> around the world. And so I guess the thing is like, yes, I'm wary of government interference, but right now we have these incredible powers who are interfering and completely no one's talking about that. <laughs> Well, we'll take this on the road as we sort of do it. <laughs> but, but, but I would say in answer to that, um, yes, but, I mean, imagine the United States puts, let's just say, and you're right, there, there's a lot of foreign aid wasted and a lot of this development money wasted. So you put $100 million in journalism fund and some of it goes to the, the, the Rappler, which would be great, right? And then Trump comes in and says, okay, let me look here. We've got a Hungarian thing and a Philippines thing and a Ukraine thing. I'm cutting them all off because, uh, frankly, it's just not how we're going to roll. Right, and all I would say is Google and Facebook do that right now. They literally <laughs> just like, they fund something and then they're like, nah, we're not in the mood, right? And yep. like they, they, they turn the dial left and right all the time. We'll be taking this on a road to a theater, <laughs> to a theater near you. Yeah, but the tickets are going to be $20 <laughs> and they go to support journalism. <laughs> and, uh, before we move on to the questions from the audience, I think you had some thoughts regarding government, uh, uh, exploration of government. Oh, well, well, I was just going to say uh, Steve Waldman's um, efforts in, around rebuild local news is another way of thinking about government support for local journalism, which is to provide tax credits and so forth to news organizations based on the number of journalists they have and so forth. And so that might be another way for more of an arm's length uh, approach to it. Yeah. Space between. Yeah. yeah. And the BBC has survived pretty nicely for a lot of years. There and have been does have some good threats. If you follow, uh, you may. I, I sort of, <laughs> I'm the sort of Britophile. Um, over the years, there's been some prime ministers who've uh, kind of, right? This is true. Definitely, this is true. yeah. Every... And you can imagine which party it is, but they, uh, <laughs> there is always a threat. But, you know, it's weathered a lot of storms. And it hasn't, I think, critically affected the coverage, yeah. which I think is always the biggest concern I hear in the U.S. Um, CBC in Canada, similarly, they've mm -hmm. faced a lot of threats. They've, they had some pretty severe cuts um, 10 years ago, I think, that, that led to some layoffs. And um, the coverage remained consistent. So. Yeah. And it is true for non-speaking uh, countries as well. 
uh, EFE in Spain, Radio Televisión Italiana in Italy, they are, um, uh, they produce pretty high quality journalism and uh, they do face occasional threats from the governments. And one thing I will add is that um, the BBC, I think one of the strengths of the BBC and the CBC is they provide really great local news in places where there's just no business mm -hmm. model. There's not a non-profit business model, a for-profit business model. It's a community in far northern Canada of like 15,000 people that's incredibly thriving and historic and important. But just to kind of build a news organization, that would be incredibly hard. And the CBC will have a radio station and a reporter producing news online specifically about and for the community. And I think that, that for me, could only really happen with government support, yeah. On to questions from the audience. Uh, hi, my name is Diana Lee. I'm a master's student at NYU's business journalism program. So after I went to journalism school, my friends keep sending me those memes on the internet saying journalists are basically like Trader Joe's customers. You're overeducated but underpaid. I think it's especially true for business journalists. Like we might be writing about billions or millions of dollars every day, but we're paid relatively very few. I was wondering, I speaking in this sense, especially in the nonprofit newsrooms context, how do you kind of incentivize those young talents like us, all of our classmates are here today. So how do you incentivize us to s kind of stay in this newsroom and keep up the in very important work without having to worry about our financial burdens? Thank you. Sure, sure. All right, well, I guess we're, the, we're, we're sort of the richest. Um, <laughs> we so far have successfully made an argument to donors, um, and they're buying it, thank goodness, but I mean, it's, it's tough, uh, you know, that if you want to operate at a certain level, you have to pay market wages. We don't say when we hire someone to ProPublica, um, okay, this is what you were making it, you know, publication X, please take a 25% haircut because that's your contribution to the enterprise. We, we don't say that. So um, we have hired fewer people at a market price. Um, I, I will say in all candor, and I, this will not shock you because you're in business journalism, um, if you want to have a sort of more um, robust, lucrative lifestyle, you pick the wrong path. <laughs> this is, none of us go into, none of, none of us went into journalism um, to, to, to get, you know, uh, far wealthier than, um, frankly, similarly talented and educated peers. I mean, when I was in college, it wasn't investment banking. Everybody went into law school, and those of us that pursued journalism understood that our lawyer friends were going to make a lot more money. But, but we were going to have, well, it turned out that wasn't true, but that's what we thought. <laughs> and, but we were going to have a lot of fun because any day you could get up and do the most exciting thing you'd ever done in your life and not even know what was going to happen. And so if you like love the spontaneity and the purpose driven life of trying to change things and having that experience, then journalism is a great fit. If, if you want to get wealthy, probably, probably not going to work. <laughs> And the sustainability challenge is real, not only for nonprofit newsrooms, but for for-profit newsrooms. Uh, my last active job in journalism was as managing editor of the Miami Herald, and for six years I managed downsizings. Um, and not only in the form of layoffs, but also in the form of no increased compensation, rethinking how reallocating resources would make them stretch further, but taking them away from okay, this year we're giving 5% increase, well, this year now we're going to three, give 3%. I'm singling the Miami Herald because it was my home, but uh, I, hundreds of newspapers found themselves in that position and still find themselves in that position. So for profit is not a guarantee of compensation either. I, I'm with Steve. If you want wealth and riches and yachts, um, maybe journalism is perhaps not the choice. <laughs> Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Pallavi Gugoy. I work for a nonprofit, NPR. I have a question about your funders. Do, how do they hold you accountable? Or do they just give you the money and just hope that you're going to, you know? That's the holy grail. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's a tough one. They <laughs> um, all start laughing. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think the hard thing with journalism is like what Julia said about like trying to make the case is like, you know, you give money to a food bank, you're going to give out this many yep. meals. Like, it's just very clear. Um, the ProPublica model around um, impact has been really informative, I think, for the whole industry around 
you know, how you kind of make the case to funders around what, how your journalism is going to change the world, really. And um, I think it's really important for, if you're thinking about starting a non-profit news organization, to set your own terms around what impact is, because funders can, can create very unrealistic expectations around what they want from your work. So we do a lot of work around defining what impact means and then giving that to the funders and saying, here, this is the impact of our journalism. Right. This is what you're going to see from our reporting. And then we have a rubric that we, can, that we feel comfortable with that they can then hold us accountable with too. So, and we set those terms early on in the process. Um, but it's hard. You know, I think some ProPublica creates really, you know, they've literally changed the world in, cer in certain policies that... Family separation story is a great example of something where a story by Ginger Thompson literally overnight, you know, completely changed government policy and changed lots of people's lives. And I think some funders want that for every story. And so you really have to be um, clear about what you can deliver at the beginning. It goes back to not letting the tail wag the dog. I mean, you're absolutely exactly, right. You, yeah. you start with where you are, what you can accomplish, what you feel you can track, and the impact that you're trying to make and then share that with your with your funders. And there may be some funders who say, that's not good enough for us, or we, you know, we, you have to answer all these questions and provide all, and if you can't, you can't. Nobody wants a failed relationship, and you don't want to spend a whole lot of time spinning in this wild vortex of trying to collect information that you just can't get, and then everybody fails, and, and everybody's unhappy. Um, as a funder, because we're a fundraiser and a funder, we like to ask our grantees to tell us what they want to accomplish. I mean, we have some idea, but tell us what you want to accomplish. Tell us how you're going to track it. And then we try to hold our grantees accountable by staying in touch with them through the grant period to hear how they're doing um, and create a dialogue so that if the project isn't going the way they thought they would or they need to spend money a little differently than they had put in their original budget, we're talking about it and we're sort of co-creating and, and working through it together. Not a lot of funders are like that. Um, but I would suggest if you're thinking about fundraising for your news organizations, foundations are very important. People think, though, that they're sort of the silver bullet. They're not. Mm -hmm. Individuals provide the majority of philanthropy in this country and are very committed, I have found, to supporting their local news enterprises because they are starting to realize just how important that is to their life, that their local news enterprises survive and thrive. And so I think it's important that we think about foundations, but we think more about individuals in our communities and think about it as a new kind of reader revenue, even if it's a million dollar gift from an individual, whatever, or a five dollar gift. And then you can keep them informed with regular updates and stewardship reports, we call them on. You know, what stories did you publish? Did you put out there? What was the impact in the community? How many readers did you have? What was the engagement time? Why was it important? And it's a little bit less, um, I don't know, detailed, tactical, whatever that sometimes foundation funders are, are looking for. Absolutely. I agree. Um, at Solutions Journalism Network, we are in the same situation as Lenfest. We are grantees ourselves. Um, funders support our work. But then we also grant, make grants to organizations that are willing to embrace Solutions Journalism. And what I would add to this very uh, complete panorama is that we have work to do in terms of clearly defining what we are capable of doing in terms of clearly defining what we can show for our work. Sometimes we overestimate. We don't like to think about that. We like to think about the journalistic uh, work and then throwing our uh, work out into the ether and whatever happens, happens. But we really need to think a little bit different and make some adjustments in saying the way Nassim's organization does. OK, what kind of impact can I guarantee? Perhaps not something as um, clear cut or a cataclysmic as ProPublica can say, but I can do other things. Attitudinal change in my community audience engagement. I can show it in different ways. And we have a lot of work to do in learning to articulate and define that uh, clearly as journalists. It hasn't resolved Philadelphia. I think Resolve Philadelphia has established what they're calling an impact tracker that they use and have shared with other organizations to sort of give a framework from which you can start um, tracking the impact of the work you're doing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we publish a quarterly sort of thing uh, that does this. And I'll just say that just quickly, the way we came to this import was um, thinking about the question, which would be interesting to this group of metrics. What are the metrics that you could possibly use? 
Um, and you know, here, here was the conversation. Well, it's not bylines, because then we'll have 300 bylines a year from every reporter, so that's not the answer. Um, it's not length, because every story will be 20,000 words instead of 10,000 words of ProPublica, and they're long enough. Um, so what is it? Uh, well, oh, clicks. Uh, well, you know, every story will now be about a celebrity. So clearly, if you're trying to figure out a, a metric, um, you come to impact because many of the other ones that are used in the commercial sector you know, would drive you in directions that I don't think would be helpful. Having said that, um, you also have to walk a balance because you shouldn't be allergic to having a large, robust audience. Clicks are good. I'd rather have a million than a thousand readers of any story we do. Um, but I don't think that should be the defining thing with the funder because if you do that, then you're going down a road that will lead to perdition. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, you have a very specific audience and a very specific topic. How do you think about this issue? Um, so I, I think that one of the challenges that we have, and this is true I think in general with investigative journalism, but maybe specifically with us, is that um, it's hard to make impact when you're talking about unaccountable hmm. companies that are ungovernable mm -hmm. by any entity, right? And so we, um, so we do a lot of investigations about like Google, right? How they're self-preferencing and like putting their own products at the top of search results. Amazon, how they're putting their own products at the top of search results. And we get some impact, like on Amazon um, was a really delightful story because they had been testifying for two years to a congressional committee saying we don't put our own um, products at the top of search results. Our story came out showing statistically with thousands of results that there was no way that they weren't doing that. And they were charged with, per they're basically been charged with perjury. So the, the House Committee said we're referring it to Department of Justice for a perjury investigation because you've lied to us about your preferencing. So that's a really great impact story. But Google also self-preferencing and you know they're like whatever guys we're still doing it and you know the thing is google has also been multiple times fined by the eu for similar things and they just keep doing it because it's like that's oh, a billion dollars a year for a fine whatever um and so what i did with impact was i sort of took the ProPublica model which they have a beautiful white paper on impact that um dick wrote and it's like you know the, it's kind of the gold standard but one thing that i have done is just made some like i'm a math person, and we do a lot of data journalism, so I just made some mathematical adjustments to it, and I put some weightings. And so basically, I wanted to weight our impact metrics to really focus on incentivizing stories that tackle a structural problem, as opposed to getting one cop fired, right? Because there's a lot of investigative journalism you can do, which is like, there's one bad person out there doing a bad thing. And yes, those people are bad, and they are doing bad things, and it, we should write about them. But when we can take on an issue that is more systemic, we're doing a more service to the public. And so I basically built a little weighting of like how many people are affected mm -hmm. and whether and to what extent they're affected that I weight each impact with. Mm -hmm. So that even if we get a minor impact on Facebook, because you know, every few weeks or months that we find them lying about something and then they fix that one little lie. You know, at least <laughs> it does affect a lot of people. It's not changing the structure, but it does at least show that there is some impact that we can talk about. And on that note, I think uh, it's time for us to close or do we have time for, no, yes, it is time for us to close. <laughs> Great panel, and I know these folks may stick around for a couple minutes if you want to visit with them upstairs, but thank you, Liza, and thank you, everybody, for this conversation. We are going to take a little bit of a break, but don't go far, because at noon we are coming back to honor our distinguished achievement winner this year, Larry Kramer. Uh, so upstairs, fresh air, stretch your legs, but come back in here by noon, and I know we're between you and lunch. Lunch will be served at 1245 outside. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank right. you. Thank you.